Tony. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Luke Nottage from this law school. Um, I'm not uh, Associate Professor Jean Huang, but she's, she's who was uh, supposed to be uh, chairing, but instead we've uh, switched roles somewhat, and uh, Jean has kindly agreed to add some comments after our main presentations, uh, drawing on her extensive experience in arbitration in China, uh, so we get an even broader perspective. Um, uh, before I go any further, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge that we're meeting here on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people uh, and uh, welcome any elders present. I think it's very good that we um, appreciate elders. Um, <laughs> and speaking of which, uh, I have to make a sad announcement. Um, Professor Marilyn Warren um, is actually stuck in a hospital in Melbourne unexpectedly, um, not for her uh, injury, but a family member. Um, very unexpected, um, and she's very sorry that she can't be here. Uh, so again, we've we've made a slight adjustment to the uh, <laughs> the program. Um, we're first going to have a presentation from Professor Giorgio Colombo, who's joining us from Nagoya University in Japan uh, via Zoom, as you can see here, and he'll be talking about uh, old arbitration law, fascinating case that he's written a book about in Japan, involving Japan, um, and then. Uh, Assistant Professor no Nomichi Teramura uh, from the University of Brunei Dar es Salaam is visiting us here in person. He'll come up in person and speak about modern Japanese law post 1872. <laughs> so bringing us up to the up to, uh, up to the present day and maybe think about uh, the future trajectory for arbitration uh, in Japan. Um, and then thirdly, instead of uh, Marilyn Warren, um, former Chief Justice of Victoria, you'll have to make do with me. She's asked me to pretend to be her <laughs> and anticipate what she was going to say in her handwritten notes, which are not at the hospital in Melbourne. <laughs> but actually, we've had some discussions over the years. She kindly contributed to a book um, uh, that Nobu and I edited for Kluwer on Asia-Pacific uh, Dispute Resolution, um, New Developments 2021. And uh, we've had some subsequent uh discussions at a distance, so I'm going to try to do my best to anticipate what she was going to say, and um, she's kindly agreed to have her notes typed up and made available to the audience, <laughs> so then you can compare what she was actually going to say today and what I'm going to guess she was going to say. Um, and then after that, uh, Jean kindly will add her comments, maybe adding an extra comparative perspective based on what we hear from about Japan and Australia, and then we'll open up to the floor. So uh, sorry for the last minute adjustments, but as some of the students of mine in the room know and other experts in arbitration know, arbitration is all about flexible procedures by consent. So if you're not happy with this arrangement, I guess you don't need to remain here, but I hope you stay and that we can uh, still have a really interesting discussion. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand over to Professor Colombo, who's an eminent uh, expert in arbitration and, arbit and Japanese law, um, but from a country that you'll have to guess from his accent and name, perhaps, without making any stereotypes. But uh, over to you, uh, Georgia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nottage. Um, I'm sure um, the audience already guessed my country of origin. So, uh, Professor Nottage, since now you are the moderator, um, according to the adjusted schedule, how long am I supposed to speak? Well, be because when I pretend to be Marilyn Warren, I will only probably take five minutes instead of the 15 to 20 minutes that she was going to present. Uh, you know, you, you can have longer, say, tw at least 20 minutes if you like. Okay, okay. But, I, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Like Thank you. To allow time for discussion and hopefully um, uh, Q&A and uh, um, contribution from the floor. So thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I could not come to Sydney because of my uh, schedule in Japan. My name is Giorgio Colombo. I'm a professor at Nagoya University Graduate School of Law. Uh, now I, I, I'll start sharing my screen so you can follow my presentation seeing my presentation. So let me start. 
Okay, um, today's presentation is about uh, a case which is known as the Maria Lutz arbitration, and which took place in Meiji, Japan. Uh, I have been researching this case for a few years, and then I, I wrote uh, a short uh, a short monograph on this topic. Um, and I need to acknowledge that uh, my research was supported by this research unit at Nagoya University called Decolonizing Arbitration, how to promote a fair and culturally sensitive use of commercial and investment arbitration. Um, if you're interested in our activities in this research unit, you're extremely welcome to reach out to me. Uh, my contacts will be given after the presentation. Now, why is a 19th century case relevant to this idea of decolonization? Because it was the first time in which an Asian country used arbitration as a tool to settle an international dispute uh, and get, got a successful outcome. Now, um, in a very Japanese fashion, allow me to um, give you the structure of my presentation. This is the introduction. Then I will discuss the facts of the case because it's impossible to understand um, the uh, Maria Lutz arbitration without knowing what the Maria Lutz incident was. Uh, then I will, of course, touch about the arbit uh, upon the arbitration and offer some uh, um, quite inconclusive conclusions, and I hope to stir your attention. So what was the Maria Lutz incident? Um, it was, I will go through the fact of the case in a second. Basically, there was a Peruvian ship chartered by a Spanish subject with a Peruvian captain and Peruvian crew carrying indentured servants from the Portuguese colony of Macau in China to Peru. Those internal servants were Chinese citizens of several regions. Because of um, bad weather, the ship had to stop in Japan for repair. And that triggered uh, uh, an incident that was solved first in the Japanese course and then by arbitration. The case is extremely fascinating for many reasons. Um, also because of its like, linguistic diversity. Uh, the documents, the original documents on the case are in a number of languages. You can see Japanese, English, Spanish, French, um, Portuguese, Chinese, uh, Russian. It's, it's an extremely complex case from an uh, international perspective. And also, is set in a moment in history, which is very important for Japan. Um, in the second part of the 19th century, uh, Japan had to open up uh, to international trade after about 240 years of isolation. And the tool by which Japan was opened up was uh, the unequal treaties. Western powers forced, um, pressured Japan to enter into some treaties of commerce, basically, that had put Japan in a situation of disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis those Western powers. That's why those treaties are called unequal, because um, they were favoring Western powers. First, the United States and then all other major players in the international arena at the time. Um, but in general, in international law at that moment of history, there was a huge debate about where to put countries. And according to many um, theories, of course, Western-centric, Eurocentric theories, countries could be divided into three categories. Civilized, which basically meant at the time Christian countries. Non-civilized, which basically meant um, social organization which did not reflect the European idea of a state, and semi-civilized, uh, organization which reflected the, West, the European idea of a state, like uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Chinese Empire, Japan, but they lacked the full um, status of civilized country. And the debate was, can we consider those entities as proper subject of international law. That leads to the importance of the role of law in Japanese modernization. Um, when Japan had to open up to the West, 
Um, the Japanese governors immediately understood that the country was in a complex situation and was uh, under the risk of colonization. And they understood that the only way to deal with Western powers was to be recognizable by them, was to modernize the country in a Western sense so that Western powers could respect Japan. And of course, the, this took many different ways, industrial reforms, economic reforms, education reforms, but law was extremely important because the theoretical justification behind the unequal treaties, which inter alia imposed consular jurisdiction and extraterritoriality on Japan, uh, was um, the fact that the, the Americans, the British and all countries which imposed treaties on Japan basically depicted, view Japanese law as backwards, as medieval. And the idea was Japan could only be considered equal to the Western powers when Japan had a legal system that was comparable to the legal system of Western power. Mm -hmm. So to use the word of a famous Japanese scholar, law was considered the barometer of the modernization. So how about the incident? Um, as I explained, there is this ship uh, carrying about 230 Chinese indentured servants from Macau to Peru. In July, the ship has to enter for repairs under um, in, in uh, Yokohama Bay. When the ship is docked in the bay, one of the Chinese passengers uh, jumps off the ship and uh, swims to a British ship, the Iron Duke, and asks for help. He says that the captain is mistreating the passenger and they are uh, under uh, th their lives are at risk. So uh, the British, um, who were very active in trying to um, interfere with the slave trade in the Pacific by the Portuguese and the Spanish, reported the matter to the Japanese authority. The authorities carried out the inspections and eventually they decided to try the captain uh, in a criminal procedure. And the captain was found guilty of mistreating the passengers, but eventually was pardoned by the Japanese judge. Some foreign council protested in saying that Japanese should not have exerted jurisdiction over foreigners. That was something reserved to the consular authorities, uh, but eventually the Japanese did not consider this protest to be grounded. Um, the captain was pardoned, so he was free to go, but the captain was not going anywhere without um, the Chinese servants. We, who were eventually uh, staying in Yokohama during the criminal proceedings. So uh, the only way to force them back on board, according to the Japanese authorities, was to uh, start a civil dispute for the specific performance of their contracts. They were contracted to work in Peru for a number of years. Uh, so the captain started this civil case asking for the specific performance of the contracts. And eventually, a case was decided in favor of the Chinese passengers. The contract were found to be unenforceable. In the meantime, a Peruvian diplomatic envoy was going to Japan uh, because Peru was interested in negotiating a treaty. Uh, so the solution of this case was added to the mission. And it was impossible to find an agreement. So the Peruvian uh, uh, representative and the Japanese representative decided to send the case to arbitration. Uh, they made the protocol for arbitration and eventually the case was decided by the Tsar of Russia in 1875. So the criminal case is really complex because even though the captain was formally tried under Japanese law, um, actually, the legislation at the time was confused at best, in the sense that the, all the shogunal legislation, the one in force until the Meiji Restoration in 1878, uh, was not longer in force, and the imperial legislation, the one enacted starting from 1868, 
was just being created. So the picture was very blurry. And if you look at the document of the case, it's very fascinating to notice that you still have a unity uh, in the sense that the governor is sitting in his judicial capacity in Yokohama. So he's both a governor for other tasks and a judge as far as jurisdiction is concerned. And the, it's kind of unique to see that the entire procedure is carried out in English, um, simply because they couldn't find any lawyers willing to act in the case, except for uh, British barristers and uh, uh, some American and British advisors. So uh, the accused person is Peruvian, speaks Spanish. The victims are Chinese, and they speak the plurality of Chinese languages and dialects. And the entire procedure is carried out in English, which is very fascinating. So as I mentioned, the captain is found guilty of mistreating the passenger, and then is pardoned. The decision is ratified by the ministry and uh, it becomes final and binding. And as I said, the Japanese tell the captain that the only way to uh, have the passengers back on board is to start civil cases. Um, now, I told you in the facts of the case how complex this situation is from an international perspective. You have a Japanese court deciding on a Peruvian captain and a Peruvian ship chartered by a Spanish subject about contract entering into in a Portuguese colony by Chinese subjects. Even today, the issue of applicable law to these contracts would be extremely complex. Imagine in 8072 in Japan with no conflict of law rules, at least not formalized. And again, you have the governor, you have uh, these foreign advisors, and you have English as a language used in the procedure, which um, it creates a lot of complexities that we will see. Those are the four issues that are brought before the judge. The validity of the contracts under the applicable law, which we still don't know which law it is. The violation of morals and public policy the nullity or voidability of the contracts because the captain, by mistreating the passengers, created an uh, inadim plenty, not estadim plentum exception, and the possibility to order specific performance. Yeah, this is um, uh, it's not directly related to arbitration, but this is just to say how the Japanese had to make a prodigious effort to demonstrate that they were capable of dialoguing with Western legal concepts, uh, sometimes creating translation as they went by. Um, it's, it's, it's very fascinating from a linguistic perspective, but I really don't envy the Japanese translators involved in the case. There is a whole debate about the fact that specific performance is a remedy of equity, but equity is misunderstood as justice uh, because is not equity in as opposed to common law. Um, the result, however, is that the contracts are not enforceable, bec not because of their content, not because of the fact that they were basically imposing people to work as slaves, but they were invalid because they were depriving those people from the protection of their courts. Um, the fact that these Chinese subjects uh, would have to work in Peru, and therefore, if there was any problem, they could not have been protected by Chinese authorities, was considered a violation of public policy, of Japanese public policy. And therefore, the judge refused enforcement of these contracts. Now, incidentally, this case is also responsible for the awful misunderstanding between geisha and prostitutes that still goes, goes on in a lot of like Western views on Japan. Um, it's it's uh, the defense by by the uh, lawyer for the captain was based on the fact that Japanese indeed had slavery contracts because they had prostitutes and the Japanese go um, they try to explain how these contracts are different. Eventually, they found the ground in if a Japanese prostitute has a problem with their contract, they are protected by Japanese authorities. The same will not apply to these Chinese subjects who will be in Peru if the contracts were performed. 
Uh, the Peruvian envoy to Japan uh, is very upset with the outcome of the case, demands reparation. The Japanese authorities refuse to pay any reparation. They say they didn't do anything wrong, and uh, it's impossible to, to, found, to find a compromise. So they decide to submit the case to arbitration. And it was, as it was customary in that period of time, um, the head of a neutral nation was chosen as arbitrator. And uh, the, the parties eventually decide to ask the Tsar of Russia, Alexander II, to act as arbitrator. And the arbitration eventually uh, takes place in St. Petersburg between the uh, late 1874 and the beginning of 1875. Yeah, um, in terms of the periodization of arbitration history, we are in uh, what Shinazi defined the age of aspirations, where arbitration is still developing, is still closer to diplomacy than to technical dispute resolution. And this case is no exception. So uh, you see the document presented by both parties. The, the, the language of arbitration is French. It's not uh, as it was customary in the 19th century. French was the language of diplomacy. Um, the, the Peruvian uh, submit a document in Spanish translated in French. The Japanese submit a bilingual document in English and French. The Peruvian position in arbitration, it's uh, basically aimed at demonstrating that slave trade is legal under many different legal system and therefore is legal under international law. Some countries did not allow that, but other did. So there was not a general principle of international law prohibiting intentor servants um, trade. And uh, it also focused, stresses a lot the fact that the captain uh, of a ship, it's largely allowed to mistreat their passengers if they create any trouble to the conduct of the navigation. Surprisingly, the Peruvian position says that the Japanese violated their own Japanese law because they didn't submit the case to the consular authorities. But the overall impression you, 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 you grasp from the Peruvian position is that uh, it's more based on like fairness and general principle of international law and diplomacy rather than on specific point of laws. Whereas the Japanese position, it's uh, technically speaking, way more refined. Uh, they refer to a principle which is still very common in investment arbitration, for example, the exhaustion of internal remedies. They blame the captain for not having appealed the decision um, to the Minister of Justice, that was an option under Japanese law at the time. Um, they refer to principle of international law. And of course, the Japanese, uh, they try to locate themselves within civilized countries in the partition I, I mentioned before the beginning of this presentation. They refer to the laws and humanity, and they say that the intent of servitude is hateful to God and man which is very weird for a country that is um, Shinto and Buddhist to say, use this kind of expression. But overall, the impression you get from the Japanese document is that is quite refined from a legal perspective and is based on formal legal considerations. Um, the, the award is really short. Um, it's not particularly remarkable and basically says, ah, Japan is right. The Tsar says, uh, we, we, we notice that the Japanese government acted in good, good faith in version of its own laws and customs without infringing general prescriptions of the law of the nations or any treaty. So they bear no liability. So Japan wins. And the legacy of this case is huge. It's even celebrated in novels. Uh, Mishima in one of his theatrical plays, The Rocky Meikan, specifically mentioned the Maria Lutz as a peak of Japanese prestige. And even years after the case, uh, Japan, this case is celebrated as Japan diplomatic triumph, um, where Japan is considered to uh, be a country capable of employing the law of humanity and deserving to enter the Committee of Advanced Nations 
and the case is highly instrumental for the rego yeah. rego negotiation of uh, unequal treaties. So, uh, sorry, I, I, there is somebody with an audio on. So. Um, I, I, this case was very important for the abolition movement in, in Japan um, against prostitution and other forms of slavery. There were other, um, most of the people involved in the case had very important roles in Japanese modernization. Japan became enthusiastical about arbitration until 1905, when another case um, Japan brought to arbitration in, in permanent court of arbitration was lost by Japan and uh, that um, ignited the distrust uh, of, of the Japanese government towards this mean of dispute resolution. But you see the echo of this case is still very strong. Uh, in 2012, for example, when Japan, uh, through a policy paper um, drafted by the Friedrich Herbert Stiftung, made again a call for a permanent seat uh, of the, in the United Nations in the Security Councils, Japan said, like, Japan has a long tradition of protecting human rights. We started protecting human rights uh, since the Maria Lutz case. And if you look at the minutes of the case uh, in the civil trial, you see that like parties involved were discussing the case. And one of the British advisors said like, um, this case will be heard of in the year 2000. And it seems that they were right. And with this, I conclude my presentation. I thank you very much for, my for your attention. And I hope you have uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Giorgio. Fantastic presentation. So interesting, particularly given that we have quite a few people from China in the room. <laughs> so I guess you, I don't know how well known that's uh, even, even in China because it connects with your own history. But anyway, uh, now we're going to move on to um, bring Japanese arbitration law and practice into the 21st century from the 19th century with uh, Nobu Teramura. I've just uh, introduced him before and also should mention he had a long connection with Sydney. Nice to have you back. He did his PhD at UNSW. I was the external advisor. I was very happy to be that, play that role. And he's also written a review of Giorgio's book, which will be published in the next uh, issue of the Journal of Japanese Law, which our Australian Network for Japanese Law helps uh, co-edit with the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. So if you want to know more about um, the book, you can also have a look at Nobu's book review when it's published, or maybe it's soon available publicly, Nobu, is it in, on SSRN, or is it going to be available publicly soon, do you think? Anyway, if you if you want the review as well as the book, you can ask Nobu. Anyway, uh, over to you. Thanks, and we'll bring up your slide, I guess. Uh, Ashley, is she here? Ashley, thank you. Um, I'll hand over to Ashley. Mute. Yeah. Oh, nice. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Well, it is my pleasure to be here today. And thank you very much, Luke, or well, Justice Warren, for having me on this panel today. Anyway, um, for my present. So in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to speak on history of arbitration in Japan. We're focusing on the arbitration in Japan in the 21st century. And my presentation, as you can see, my presentation is based on a book chapter, which I co-authored with Professor Nortech. And the chapter is to be published in 2020. Oh, and I'm a, about myself, I'm Dr. Nobumichi Teramura. I'm assistant professor at the University of Brunei, Darussara in Southeast Asia. So I'm very happy to be here today. And well, as, jo as Professor Colombo mentioned in his presentation, this is a kind of Japanese practice and tradition. So um, please allow me to provide the outline of my presentation first. 
So I will start from introduction and I will well briefly overview Japan's early encounters with um, Western arbitration and then look at some more specific areas of the development of arbitration in Japan. So um, introduction, well, uh, perhaps as you as some of you know from the well from well, talks by Professor Luke Notich, arbitration is not very popular in Japan, quite unfortunately. But nevertheless, arbitration has had quite a long modern history in Japan, and this list provides a series of events. Um, Happened in, happened in Japan related to international arbitration. So the oldest event is as Professor Giorgio um, discussed the Maria Ruth arbitration in 1873. So almost 150 years ago, Japan experienced the kind of Western arbitration already. And then Japan experienced a number of events after that. So the first arbitration legislation came into force in 1890. The New York Convention was adopted in 1961, and the 1890 legislation was amended in 1996, and the brand new Arbitration Act was established in 2003, and yeah, and some other events followed. And in addition, Japan, well, perhaps it is fair to say Japan in general is pro arbitration. So, for example, the courts have been pro-arbitration for many years and they are always keen to respect the spirit of uh, pro-arbitration pro spirit of the model law and the new convention and there are a couple of arbitration institutions operating in japan such as the tokyo maritime arbitration commission and the japan commercial arbitration associations and they uh, very active in importing international best practices of arbitration into Japan. So they have revised their arbitration rules many times until today. And Japan is com uh, relatively, Japan is a comparatively active proponent of investor dispute settlement provisions in international investment agreements. So overall, Japan seems to be a pro arbitration state. But However, um, arbitration is not popular in Japan. Why? Because first, people do not know arbitration. And even some top lawyers perhaps have never heard of arbitration because they have never had a chance to study um, arbitration proper properly in their law school. And um, the next point is a bit ironic. So big law firms in Japan are, of course, aware of the advantages of arbitration, but they don't like to have, well, these big law firms in Japan do not want to have arbitration in Japan. So they want to have arbitration in Singapore, Hong Kong, London, or elsewhere. And, and well, sometimes they are well somehow forced to include an arbitration clause designate Japan as a seat, then they will do their best to avoid having arbitration because they don't want to have arbitration in Japan. So as a result, unsurprisingly, um, Japan's major arbitration institutions are still struggling and their case load is not developing yet. And anyway, I'm going to speak these points more in more detail in due course. But uh, what I'm going to do in this presentation is um, to consider how arbitration ended up with becoming an unpopular option in Japan. Sorry, Luke, how much time do I, how much time is that? 40 minutes, okay. Uh, 14, not 40. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, um, so this slide shows the Japan's early encounters with arbitration, but perhaps I can skip, skip most of it. Yeah, but well, for, for, for some time, arbitration became very popular, but this popularity did not last long because of the house tax case. And what was what the um, permanent court of arbitration held in the house tax case was well, Japan does not have right, right to impose taxes on buildings as well as land owned by foreigners. So, yeah, of course, Japanese elites at that time got very angry with this case so that arbitration was no longer popular in Japan after that. But 
Um, so it took some time for arbitration to recover a uh, well, kind of rep reputation in Japan. So after the World War II, Japanese government, well, the Japan started resuming some proactive engagement with international adjudication, but well, more than a half century had passed since the house tax case. And um, and this and in the next part of my presentation explains yeah how uh, sorry this slide explains how Japan's old arbitration law was established. So um, well after the Meiji Restoration, the Japanese government undertook extensive comparative analysis of various contemporary Western legal systems to develop at home a sufficiently modern legal regime. Why, why, why did Japan have to do that? Because as Professor Giorgio mentioned in his presentation, around the end of the Edo period and around the beginning of the Meiji period, Japan was forced by the Western powers to sign unequal treaties. And what was stated in the unequal treaties was first, Japan has no rights to impose um, custom taxes on um, imported goods. And second, Japan has no rights to um, adjudicate foreigners who, has co who have committed criminal offenses in Japan. And of course, Japan, uh, Japanese elites in the Meiji period was, were very keen to renegotiate these unequal treaties. And one of the requirements imposed by the Western powers for renegotiation was to establish a sophisticated sophisticated westernized legal system in Japan. So that's why um, Japan at the time was very keen to study Western legal systems. And then, well, their efforts were somehow rewarded. So they studied Western legal systems very hard and especially they studied the German law very hard. And as a result, the unequal authorities had been successfully renegotiated by the late 19, late 1890s. And because of this background, the old arbitration law was also inspired by German legal, German arbitration law. And this arbitration law was, well, somehow very up to date at that time. So the arbitration provision, the arbitration law was very supportive of arbitration in light of the international standard at that time. But the problem was Japan did not update this old this law for 100 years after that. So um, these provisions were unchanged for the next 100 years. And by the late 1980s, some commentators um, raised concerns about the old law, saying, well, this is just outdated and some rules look revealed, so we should reform arbitration law, et cetera, et cetera. However, um, it took some more time. So we had to wait until 2003 to have a brand new arbitration law in the country. So this new arbitration act, it was, was brand new, and it, but it was based on the um, 1985 model law uh, prepared by Anshral. But it diverges from the model at some point. For example, it covers both domestic and international disputes. Also, the model law covers only international disputes. And oh yeah, it does not limit its coverage to co well, the arbitration law does not cover its co does not limit its coverage to commercial disputes, also uh, the model law does, and so on. And well, subsequent there are subsequent legislative developments. For example, in August 2020, the Foreign Lawyers Act in Japan were amended, and the amendment expanded the scope of arbitration-related services that foreign lawyers may engage in Japan. And then this year, in April 2023, the bill to revise the Arbitration Act was promulgated and um, some important changes were imposed. For example, um, the bill included new rules to provide the court in Japan with an option to proceed without the parties submitting the Japanese translations of all or some of foreign observers and evidence. So as uh, Professor Giorgio demonstrated in his presentation, the translation takes time and costs money. So this is a big change for some um, some lawyers working in Japan, but 
but um, well, probably, but uh, but well, in our view, I mean, in Professor Notage's and my view, perhaps Japan has to undertake more drastic legislative reform. And at some, well, in some points, the new arbitration bill is slightly disappointing because they, the, the new arbitration law does not have any rules to ensure the legitimacy of third party funding and emergency arbitration. Also, such rules are available in um, Hong Kong and Singapore. And this slide shows the uh, um, role of the courts in the, his in the um, history of arbitration in Japan. And what I should tell you through this slide is well, basically, the Japanese courts are pro arbitration for many years. So, uh, the Japanese courts are. Well, the, they are very pro arbitration. They always respect the model law and the new convention, etc. Of course, there are some well minor, there are some reservations. But overall, perhaps it's fair to say the Japanese courts are pro arbitration. And this slide shows the history of the arbitration institutions in Japan. Uh, perhaps the oldest arbitration in the country is the Kobe Steamship Agents and Brokers Association. And this institute was established uh, well, before 1912, but they started providing arbitration related services in 1912. And then 14 years later, TOMAC was established as a sub body of the Japan Shipping Exchanging Corporation. And the, this TOMAC succeeded the arbitration related businesses from KCSB. And in relation to international commercial arbitration, the JCAA's predecessor, the International Commercial Arbitration Committee, was established in 1950. And, and this institution was reorganized and renamed as the JCAA in 1953. Sorry, look how much time we have. Maybe five minutes. Five minutes. All right, and this slide shows, shows the buildings in which Tomac and JCAA are located. And, uh, but well, unfortunately, the JCAA is still struggling. And as you can see uh, in this chart, the number of new arbitration requests referred to JCAA is very modest. So in 2018, 13 new requests were certain new requests were made to um, JCAA, and this number has not changed much since then. And this is very different from, for example, um, the regional competitors such as SIAC, Singapore International Arbitration Center. Uh, well, according to their website, in 2000, well, when, well, in 2019, before the pandemic they accepted around more than 1,000 new arbitration requests. So the, dif dif the difference is very significant. But nevertheless, um, we have a few more arbitration, well, also those exist, those old arbitration institutions in Japan are still struggling. Um, surprisingly, we have a few more arbitration institutions in Japan. The one is Japan Sports Arbitration Agency, and as you know, this institution uh, has expertise in solving sports related disputes. And in February 2018, Japan International Dispute Resolution Center was established, but this is not quite an arbitration institution because this body doesn't offer any arbitration related uh, arbitration administration services. What they do is to provide facilities um, for well dispute resolution in Osaka and Tokyo, but unfortunately, the uh, Tokyo facility was closed down in May in May this year. And another arbitration institution is International Arbitration Center in Tokyo. And according to a few news reports, this is this institute is actually the first institution in Asia that focuses on patent disputes. And this and uh, these photos show the buildings in which these arbitration institutions are located. And perhaps time's up, so perhaps I uh, will just skip this slide. And anyway, this part was completely written by Professor Notech. So if you have any questions, maybe you can always come back to Professor Notech. So to, to conclude, um, well, Japan has never stood still. 
since its first encounter with modern international arbitration in the Meiji era. So Japan has always doing their best to uh, be a next be the next arbitration hub in the region. But unfortunately, they and sometimes they launched new experimental initiatives, especially before the Tokyo Olympics. However, their new initiatives were disrupted by the pandemic and perhaps the uh, well, poor, poorly managed the Olymp poorly managed Tokyo Olympics. So we don't know yet whether arbitration will take off in Japan, but I hope at least this presentation has shown some essential building blocks are now in place in Japan. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so I'm going to pretend to be Professor Marilyn Warren, ACAC, <laughs> and give you a quick <laughs> rundown on arbitration history in comparison in Australia. Um, and in some ways, uh, we're, we're quite similar. Um, if we go back to the 19th century, um, uh, I'm not uh, able to comment. You'll have to read Professor Warren's book with uh, former Justice Clyde Croft and uh, uh, a co-author, very good textbook, and which uh, I was hoping Professor Warren would summarise for us. Um, but if we get into the 20th century in Australia, um, we sort of have a, an overhang of old law derived from, in this case, not Germany, like Japan, but instead from England, of course as the former colonial power in this country. So, um, and the although there's some recent uh, research by Professor Bricolakis at University, College, at University of London suggesting maybe this is a bit overstretched, um, uh, in the 19th century, in following over into early uh, 20th century English law, there was a tradition of more active court intervention in arbitrations um, in London because quite a few were decided by non-lawyers involving commodity disputes and so on, where a lot of factual issues, not so many legal issues. So to keep some so-called quality control, the uh, English courts were a bit more involved and you could ask for um, the courts to review awards of arbitrators for errors of law. And uh, we inherited this um, tradition in Australia. Uh, and so our arbitration laws were initially enacted um, by the states and territories, um, eventually uniformly, but with applying to both domestic and international arbitration and allowing for review for errors of law by arbitrators. And so this is a um, departure from the sort of European civil law tradition, which is reflected in the Unstrau Model Law of 1985, where um, there was no review by courts for errors of law by arbitrators. Um, uh, now, it started to change in Australia uh, when in 1975 we enacted the, the federal level um, using the Foreign Powers Act and the Constitution, the power and the the Constitution, the International Arbitration Act in 1975, to give effect to the New York Convention, which enforces uh, foreign seated arbitration agreements and awards, um, and also doesn't allow courts then in Australia to, when you're enforcing an award, to not do that because the foreign seated arbitrators made errors of law. Uh, so it gives more deference to uh, the arbitral process. Um, but and then the next step, uh, and incidentally, Australia was a bit slow in enacting uh, this law to ratify the New York Convention in the mid 70s, because Japan uh, was one of the first again in Asia to ratify that 1958 New York Convention. Um, and uh, the next step came in the around 1989 when. Um, that International Arbitration Act was 
at its first major amendment. And for Australia seated international arbitrations, we adopted the 1985 model law. And this was quite progressive at the time, like the, the new UN model law template for legislation uh, around the world, you know, had only come in 1985. And we were like one of the first off the blocks along with Hong Kong at the time, and also 1989. We were quicker than Singapore. They only enacted a law on this basis in 1994. Um, and of course, we've just seen that Japan um, was only shamed into finally doing something when Korea in 1999 enacted its model law-based arbitration legislation and Japan followed in 2003. But notice, as you say, as here, as you mentioned here, the, the, the Japanese, in a way, then uh, legislatively went a bit further than Australia because it extended the model law regime to domestic arbitrations. So in Japan, for a domestic arbitration, again, you can't appeal for an error of law by the arbitral tribunal, um, as well as for international arbitration the seat. Now, in, in Australia, you still uh, could, um, uh, and so it's sort of an overhang for from the uh, English law, you could, for domestic arbitration, still um, have to some degree review of error of law by the arbitrators. Um, despite enacting for international arbitration in 1989, the model law regime for, um, in Australia. Uh, also, in 1989, we, because I suppose model law was so new and more gave more deference to the arbitration process and the party autonomy and so on, less scope for court intervention, we had the section 21 that said the parties could opt out of that model law regime, in which case they would end up back in the state, the old state uniform commercial arbitration acts that still provided, you know, more court supervision of arbitrations compared to the model law regime. Um, in 2010, however, we had a second major amendment of the International Arbitration Act, which revised section 21, no more opt-outs you can't if you have an international arbitration seated in australia you just get the model or regime uh, you can't opt into the regime for domestic arbitrations with more supervisions and um this is having considerable impact in uh practice because all well, the domestic arbitrations that happen particularly around construction disputes in australia um have to use this sort of modern contemporary uh uh partly European civil law influenced approach to arbitration, uh, which gives more deference to party autonomy and less scope for court intervention. Um, uh, also, um, we started revising, yeah, because we started also re revising for domestic arbitration, those old English laws inspired commercial arbitration acts and reformulated them also on a model law basis. Although we left in some twists, so unlike Japan, there's still a scope for in domestic arbitrations, appeals to the courts for some errors of law, but still the template now is this model law regime. Now, um, I think since that 2010 amendment um, at the federal level in the International Arbitration Act, and then the subsequent amendments to the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act at the state level, the case law has also become more consistently pro-arbitration. And still, until 2010, you'd have to say it was a case of sort of two steps forward, one step back. There would be some, you know, pro-arbitration judgments in the sense of, you know, respecting the, the not just the wording, but the spirit of these in international instruments like the New York Convention and the model law, um, at least for international arbitrations. Um, but you know, there were other court decisions that were still very questionable and didn't uh, put Australia in a good light, you know, in international arbitration events and so on. But I think you can see a turning point. And you can track it. I've written about challenges to um, procedural decisions of arbitrators and so on. And you can see the Australian courts more consistently from 2010 onwards also saying, well, look, we should let the arbitrators get on with their job, not be too interfering and setting aside awards and recognizing challenges to arbitrators if they're trying to do things in different ways to what we would do in domestic litigation or even and domestic arbitrations. Um, 
Uh, and but on the other hand, like Japan, uh, we uh, we haven't really seen huge growth in <laughs> international arbitration seated in Australia. Uh, Akika was established in 1985, Australian Centre for International Commercial Arbitration, and um, uh, was initially based in Melbourne, moved to Sydney about a few years after I immigrated here. There's no real causal connection, unfortunately. I can't claim that that was the reason. It was more some personalities at the top of the organisation and so on, and trying to rebrand, reboot Akika. Uh, and, uh, but all through the first decade of the 21st century through to about 2010, the average case numbers in Akika were one to three filings per annum, right? Um, then Akika doesn't publish regular statistics every year, but recently I noticed an annual report reviewing the last 10 years, and you find that the case filings were between three to six, seven, maybe eight, from about 2011 through to um 2017 per annum, and then from 2018 to 2021, uh, significant increase, but we're talking 12 to 16 per annum filings. So, you know, if you look at, compare that with JCA arbitration filings, at least Akika is on an upward trajectory, but it's from a very low base. And uh, and of course, Japan also has Tomac arbitrations for maritime disputes, which would be included, which would be the sort of things covered also by Kika arbitrations. Um, so uh, not a huge success story if you look at arbitration case filings, but maybe that's not. And, and part of the reason for that could be that uh, compared to some other arbitration uh, centres around the world, like even London, we still have a tradition of using barristers to run arbitrations as counsel in arbitrations. In, in London, since the Wolf reforms in the late 90s, we have solicitor advocates and we have law, big law firms, even smaller law firms, where the solicitors run the whole arbitrations as counsel. Here we bring in the barristers who speak, very slowly, like they're in court, and they try to take points of evidence, which international arbitrators don't care about, because it's partly influenced, more influenced on that point by the civil law tradition. So uh, it's a style of arbitration that's still mainly in that respect influenced by the more uh, English tradition, even though English tradition has moved on. <laughs> but anyway, um, and obviously, even more so than Japan, Australia has the tyranny of distance. You know, if the seat is here, the hearing venue defaults to um, defaults to the seat usually, unless the parties and arbitrators all agree to have a hearing somewhere else. Um, and if there's a dispute about the challenge to the arbitrator with the award and whatever, and you want to uh, even bring witnesses and so on, you have to come to court in Australia. And yes, it's true that we can, we, we're more used to be using video technology and so on, like Professor Colombo zooming in. This happens in arbitration, particularly since the pandemic, but now we're reverting back to physical hearings and so on um, for substantive hearings with witnesses and so on. Um, so uh, maybe even more so than Japan, we struggle with that a little bit. But in other respects, uh, if you look at the trajectory of Australian uh, arbitration history, um, we're, we're quite successful. Like our court judgments have improved and are cited by courts in other countries now, um, even in Singapore. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, we started improving our case law because we started referencing and citing the, the judgments of not just the UK and the US, but uh, Hong Kong courts and then the Singaporean courts. And now it's going both ways. Um, uh, and, you know, we export our arbitration expertise. The Australian law firms follow their clients over to arbitrations in Singapore or around the Asian region. Um, and, uh, and of course, we, we teach uh, everyone about arbitration to train them up to go, to go offshore uh, into new pastures and some of them come back. And, um, and so all the built to, to conclude, like you did, 
not boot. Uh, all the building blocks are there, right? The essential building blocks are in place. Build it, and they will come. So you know, Australia has 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 made some significant uh, steps forward, both in the legislation, the case law, the arbitration institution. Like I've been involved in the rules committee reforms for fifteen years, um, and you know, it's a credible option, which it probably wasn't. Uh, Australia as a seat. 20 years ago, wasn't recommended. We didn't have the building blocks that are now in place. So I'd like to stop there. And uh, I really hope that did justice to <laughs> Professor Warren. And I'm, again, I apologize that she couldn't come due to personal reasons, um, and family reasons. Um, and uh, she will provide her own written up remarks for anyone who's interested afterwards, we'll email it to you so you can compare what uh, she really thinks. So I'll stop there and pass over now to Jean Huang to make uh, a few comments, maybe from a broader perspective, including her expertise in relation to China, and then we'll open up to the floor. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. It's indeed a learning process for me. Uh, I, I just want to make a, a few comments to Professor Klobo and then to Lobo and at the end to my dear colleague, um, Professor Luke. Um, so for the first case, Maria Luz incident, I think it's indeed uh, um, fascinating, uh, especially from a conflict of law scholar perspective. Uh, actually, my first question will be which law <laughs> indeed applied in that case. Um, besides that, uh, um, what I feel, you know, fascinating, actually go beyond the applicable law from two aspects. The first aspect is the interplay between the civil law, which is the domestic trial, uh, as well as uh, criminal issues. But at the end, we actually interplay the, with the international proceeding, which is a state-to-state -state arbitration. So this is a typical, of course, a classical case here. You have individuals and the whole case started with a passenger who try, you know, to, to, to help themselves and swim to another ship, ask for help. Of course, there may be some background stories uh, where Professor Klobo has no time to share with us, you know, why this particular uh, um, passenger really swim to let a particular ship, you know, maybe he know that the ship belongs to UK, uh, which actually in the colonized periods, you know, represent a superior position and maybe offer help. So this remind me, um, actually, in China, um, China was a semi-colonized country. Uh, in my hometown, Shanghai, there was concession um, regions. So there are actually a lot of stories, a lot of documentaries about individual Chinese people. They run, they escape, they flee to the concession zone in order to get help, either judicial help or other type of protection from a country, a power, an authority, which is supposed to enjoy supremacy to people who cannot be protected by their own country. So this is a particular difficult period of time, I think, for Chinese people and also for Japanese people. But actually, the question today for us is, what's international law? And I think the pro uh, Professor Colombo asked a fantastic question, which is, who is the subject matter of international law, or whether every subject matter should enjoy an equal protection under international law? So I think what uh, uh, Maria Lu's case, actually the implication for today is, uh, although we are at the end of uh, the colonization period, but there is uh, 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 important scholarship about the new colonization. And the typical example is whether today the multinational enterprises still carry the mission as the older day, the Eastern Indian, 
you know, company they they used to to you know, for example, sell um those drugs or whatever to to Chinese people. All they in this case is to sell slaveries, you know. Um, so 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 the question actually is. Should we really reflect on the colonization? Uh, also, going back, uh, you know, to today's class about the arbitration, I think another fascinating point is here. There's two countries: one is Peru, and the other one is Japan. Actually, they are not a powerful country in that period of time. Peru itself is a colonized, not semi-colonized, like a fully colonized uh, uh, country. And then you, you see who they ask for remedy. They are not asked for, for United Kingdom, right? They are not asking for other traditional like Spain or Portugal, maybe those are the country related. And they finally go to Russia. So, so this actually relate to um, um, Professor uh, uh, Nottage's uh, discussion about um, Australians' effort to become a international popular state for arbitration. So, uh, so this related me to an example of uh, Sweden. At least I I know the Scott Home um, Center for International Arbitration has been chosen by quite a number of. Uh, bilateral investment treaty concluded by China as a venue for investment arbitration. So why? Of course, maybe because of their expertise. But the second actually is the neutrality. So, so um, this go back to how a venue, a state or city can be really selected by arbitration users and neutrality certainly is a very important issue. And the second, you know, go to Lobo's uh, fantastic review of history of arbitration in Japan. So I would say that uh, in my home country, China, also experienced a very similar struggle learning process from Germany and also learning process from the model law, although China hasn't really adopted the model law today. But uh, actually today, when we look at uh, um, the, the, the use of arbitration in China, obviously domestically and internationally, and um, China is uh, in arbitration and uh, arbitration has been more frequently used in, in China. If you look at the, the number of cases filed to, um, to, to leading Chinese arbitration institutions, here I talk about mainland China, um, for example, um, um, CTAC, you know, uh, uh, Center for International Commercial and Economic Arbitration, you know, uh, they, they actually split a, a few years ago. And also, for example, Beijing um, Arbitration um, Commission or Shanghai International Arbitration Center and Hong Kong International Arbitration Court. So, so the question is why, you know, because Japan and, and China both are civil law countries, both learn from Germany and Chinese civil code still today, and Chinese civil code was, uh, uh, um, you know, released uh, two years ago, significantly draw from German jurisprudence. So why? I think there are maybe three reasons from my very humble um, view. So the first reason is we need to ask the who use arbitration, which is arbitration users. So if you look at the uh, um, in Chinese context, we see that Chinese multinational companies actually they 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 prefer to use arbitration. I think the one reason is when you negotiate a contract with your opposing party and the other party actually does not trust the Chinese court due to political issues. Uh, this may not, I'm not sure, but I suspect that this may not be an issue for Japan. <laughs> I see our Japanese judge is locking his head. 
Um, I, I, I assume that when a Japanese multinational company, for example, Hondo, you know, Toyota, they negotiate a contract with a, a foreign company, maybe the foreign opposing party, they, they won't have a political concerns of Japanese court. But actually in China, when you talk about the bail, uh, bail on road, one bail on one road initiative, there are a lot of uh, evidence that uh, foreign companies that have a concern to go to Chinese court uh, due to political issues, due to the, uh, the you, you, you know, uh, local protectionism. So this downside of Chinese legal system actually become an incentive for arbitration. Uh, and the second reason is, um, the second reason actually is uh, Chinese arbitration, if you look at the investment arbitration, there are more and more Chinese companies, they prefer arbitration as a way to protect themselves, which actually is, uh, I think it may not be an intended consequence of Chinese BIT, because China concluded the large amount of bilateral investment treaty, the original purpose is to attract foreign companies, foreign investors to China. But actually today, those BITs become a weapon uh, or a protection for Chinese companies they try to invest abroad. So, so with the popularity of more and more Chinese companies that invoke investment arbitration, this become a way that for domestically, um, there are more people, either uh, academics or lawyers, even medias, they they very positively, you know, know uh, very positively. Um, publish about the arbitration. They, you know, actually investment arbitration sometimes in Chinese media course. So we, we, if we talk about the narrative, they become a positive narrative to advocate that the Chinese companies use international law tools to safeguard their rights. Just like uh, Professor Klobo's case, you know, Japanese government has been portrayed very positively as a weaker party, but they use international law law to protect themselves. And also the, the third reason I would say is Hong Kong. Um, and the reason why Hong Kong developed as an international arbitration center, of course, due to the inheritance from the common law heritage from, uh, from UK, but also because, you know, it has a large market in, you know, uh, mainland China. Um, if party they have concern to arbitration in, in mainland China, they have an alternative, very convenient alternative in Hong Kong. Uh, in the recent years, the Supreme People's Court has issued uh, several arrangements, for example, the asset preservation arrangement to enable Hong Kong Arbitration Tribunal and Hong Kong Court to go through the arrangement to preserve assets in, in mainland China for enforcement purpose. Um, but of course, I have a question for, for, for Noble. My question is why the Japanese court is so slow to, to you know, I think one of your slides actually has a sentence about the, the, the court actually is very slow in supporting arbitration. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, before we open up to the floor, um, I'll just follow up on that. So um, uh, I've actually done some empirical studies of how long uh, Australian court, well, particularly I could get data for the federal court, which is one of the, which became one of the most progressive sort of leading the pack, uh, particularly from around 15 years ago in, in dealing with arbitration, International Arbitration Act related cases. And I was a bit disappointed that for the three years before the 2010 amendments and then three years after, there was no change, didn't speed up. I was hoping with all this amendments, all this activity, 
lawyers would understand arbitration better and stop running silly arguments that took up more time and taxpayers' money. Um, and then I did a reboot after uh, in 2016, still no real significant, statistically significant change. But then the last three years of my book, 2021, um, well, nobody, you, I think you helped, didn't, didn't you? We, uh, yeah, and and we found, oh, there was a little bit of an improvement. So, um, but to my knowledge, we haven't done a comparison. There's been no comparison in um, uh, in Japan. Um, a German scholar actually contacted me and said, "Oh, I'm doing. I've noticed your paper. I'd like to do the same for Germany, and so on." Uh, but um, um, I suspect that the Japanese court decisions are not, on average, and in the median, uh, not too slow. It's just like in Australia, we have a few cases which take up a lot of time, and partly that's the fault of the lawyers, not the judges. Um, but it, uh, anyway, uh, okay, we, uh, can I see if we have any questions in the room? Um, and uh, is there one in the chat? It's another possibility. Um, yeah. Can I get a certificate of attendance for this event? Uh, uh, but, yeah. I will answer that directly or actually you respond. But, uh, do we have any substantive questions any, uh, or comments, please? Um, and Ashley has a, uh, a mic at the back and I have another one here. But please, um, it's Brian. Brian from the Philippines, but no, please use the mic so that Giorgio can hear. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my question is, do you foresee that the trend in arbitration will be more towards a centralized approach? So the larger arbitral institutions will mm -hmm. become more popular. So they might set up alternative branches. Mm -hmm. Or is it more towards a decentralized approach where yeah. more pop the other arbitral institutions around the world will be more popular? Because yeah, that's feel... a very good question. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, well, maybe I'll talk about Australia pretending to be Marilyn Warren again, and then Japan, China. Um, so um, I think uh, Australia, a lot of countries have, you know, first ratified the New York Convention to encourage foreign seated arbitration. And then as their courts and the users, the companies have become used to arbitration, then they've encouraged the legislatures to enact the model law. And as part of that, They've set up arbitration institutions. Um, uh, and for emerging small countries, you know, in, in the big world of international arbitration, I think it's, you know, you, you can't, you're starting with such small numbers and it's so hard to get noticed, especially against those bigger arbitration institutions like the ICC, which is global, and then the other big institutions now, like traditionally the LCIA in London. And, ICDR in the US and now more recently Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, China, uh, the big Chinese arbitration institutions that you you know you have to have a you have to have a smaller uh, yeah you, you you can't spread too much especially if if your government doesn't have a um, you know doesn't want to invest in an arbitration center they'd rather invest in I don't know. Um, creating a green economy, you know, it's like that was a bigger priority and it's, you know, uh, flying people around the world for international arbitrations and then is not as a good investment for a government even to compare hosting a major sporting event, right? So to give a plug for next, tomorrow's a sports arbitration seminar from 4 p.m. Um, but uh, so I think Australia tried to, have a separate like commission we called it for maritime disputes but it was always closely linked to akika and i think it's been subsumed in perth wa like we saw in the pandemic they basically declared independence so they of course had to have their own arbitration institution at one stage and it was quite a good idea they said well we do a lot of resources uh, contracts and disputes we have a lot of lawyers over there companies that that are specialists it's uh, in some way it's closer to singapore than sydney We'll have our own specialist center. They set it up for resources dispute arbitration. Um, and But it didn't really take off. It's now, I think, been subsumed into a key. So that's just the Australian um, experience, which is try to centralize to create some minimum critical mass. Um, 
but Japan's taking a different view because it's setting up all these other um, uh, just um, institutions. So, um, and then, well, I'll let Nobu talk about that. And then, yeah, no, so here, yeah, have a seat. And then Gene can maybe talk about China, which has got 270 arbitration. Uh, hi, uh, first of all, uh, Brian, uh, long time no see. How have you been? Uh, he, he, he's my former student at, uh, in the Philippines at De La Salle, um, De La Salle Law School, and uh, it's very nice to see you again. Um, I taught you in 2017, if I remember. Seven, 17, yeah, because you were in the second cohort, I think. Second, yeah, no, second, sorry, because the first time I went to La Salle was 2016. And and the next time I went there in 2017, and I remember you were in that cohort. So it's good to see you again. And um, thank you very much for a very good question, as you did when I was teaching at La Salle. Um, anyway, um, experience, well, perhaps I, I, sh I would like to speak um, from two perspectives. One, one is from the perspective of Japan and one is from the perspective of Southeast Asia, um, in which I'm based for the moment or for, for many years. Uh, well, yeah, Japan is quite decentralized. The, Jap the Japanese arbitration market is, as you know, very, very modest. Uh, modest, in other words, very small. Or, oh, well, very, very, well, anyway, very, very small. But nevertheless, we have how many arbitration institutions? Perhaps we have three or four arbitration institutions. Um, dealing with international cases, but we have um, some more arbitration institutions dealing with domestic cases. Um, it doesn't make any sense for me. So my suggestion is, well, Japan should centralize arbitration institution and um, they should decide where to put the money, taxpayers' money into. So if they think JCAA should be more developed, they should focus their investment into there instead of uh, making other, well, or instead of making fancy buildings elsewhere. Um, but um, in terms of Southeast Asia, um, in my view, it's more, well, I'm speaking Southeast Asia in general. Uh, fortunately, or, or unfortunately, it's getting more centralized, centralized into um, Singapore. Singapore is now very, very influential in Southeast Asia. And especially I'm now based in Brunei. And the typical mindset of Brunei people is, oh, Singapore is doing this. Okay, can, can we just do that? So like this. Um, and it, surprisingly, it's happening elsewhere. For example, before coming to Brunei, I was based in Cambodia for a while. Cambodian people have sort of similar mindset. So they always look look up. They are, they are always looking into what's going on in Singapore. And if some, if some new developments happened in Singapore, they are keen to import these um, well, allegedly international best practices into, um, into Cambodia. So, yeah. Um, so, well... So, so to summarize, well, experience with Japan is quite decentralized, but the experience, but in Southeast Asia, it's quite getting more and more centralized. And yeah, once again, thank you very much, and good, good to see you again. Um, in China, they are also very decentralized arbitration institutions. Um, I, I think this is not uh, really purposeful because actually in China, many things, they are centralized. Um, the, the reason why um, the arbitration institutions are decentralized, I think two aspects. One is there is a historical reason um, because those arbitration institutions, they, they are not non-governmental. They are also not governmental. So there is a very awkward position of those institutions in the whole judiciary or in the whole system. So, um, so it is not justified in terms of law that the local government or central government to require them to, to merge and acquire or, or consolidate it. Um, and, and the second issue is especially regarding noble talk about the Singapore. Um, I, I actually think um, not every country need to consider to make itself as um, arbitration popular or, or whatever, you know, in order to attract arbitration. So the, the, the reason is, you know, recently in China, um, enacted 
the uh, the foreign sovereignty the the foreign state sovereignty immunity act uh, which is which demonstrated China you know uh transit from uh transit from you know the the whole um so you know fully sovereign immunity to restrictive sovereign immunity theory so i was interviewed for a question asking whether the purpose that china enacted this law is to make china become a dispute resolution center or whatever you know uh or to attract arbitration uh, i do not think so because uh, um at least for China, it's not like Singapore, which is a small jurisdiction who may consider arbitration can generate a huge revenue or to create a lot of job opportunity. I do not think like revenue from dispute resolution or job opportunity will be a concern or even a consideration for Chinese policy makers uh, there are always more important, uh, higher level issues for, uh, at least for mainland government. Therefore, um, I do not think a centralized or decentralized arbitration in institution will be a, a issue that uh, enjoying a higher priority for Chinese government. Thank you. But that's just my view. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, getting my glasses to read the question in the chat. Uh, Georgia, do you have any um, views on this question from Brian about whether there's a pressure towards having more um, centralization and ever bigger, large column? Um neo-colonizing arbitral institutions as opposed to, you know, diversified, nimble, uh, diverse institutions? Um, well, I, I just wanted to mention that Singapore, um, who, the, which now is booming and it's becoming a major hub, already become a major hub. And the reason why Singapore boomed is because the Singaporean government decided to invest a lot uh, in this center. Uh, when SIAC was established in 1991, it was a minor player, and it has been a minor player for a couple of decades, and then it became a major center, but not out of the blue. Of course, the growth of China and, and, and the necessity of having a Chinese-speaking country, well, with, a country with Chinese-speaking capacity close to China, but not in China, was, was a major plus for Singapore. But there was a careful and extremely well-funded governmental effort behind SIAC. So um, there are institutional reasons also behind the success of Singapore. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a big difference from even Australia or Japan. Japan's a, like Australia made a, a small effort from the governmental side around 2010 with the Kika having a hearing room smaller than this one, uh, thanks to a government subsidy, which is probably no longer available. Um, so they've moved into a smaller room cupboard. Um, but uh, the and and in Japan is is now putting some uh, support, uh, but even that's finished. The pandemic came along, bigger priorities like saving lives uh, or Tokyo Olympics. So. Uh, good point. And finally, last question. This is quite a good one. Thank you very much, Dimitro, uh, to Professor both Colombo and Teramura. It seems that international arbitration rules have room for improvement, lacking some basic features like appointment of an emergency arbitrator um, or recognition of that. Uh, but to be fair, Australia still hasn't amended its law to clarify that point, like Hong Kong and whatever. But However, to compete with the solid arbitration hubs in the region like Hong Kong and Singapore, in my opinion, Japan should not only catch up with current trends, but provide something more, something that will give an advantage over other places. What do you think it can be? You're allowed to pick one thing. <laughs> Nobu and Georgia. And the race is on. Three. We only have two. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, um, my hope which is just a hope, 
is that Japan is capable of projecting itself as a truly international uh, arbitration country. In other words, Japan is a strongly civil law country and the professional elite is educated on a common law model abroad after they get the qualification in Japan. Uh, I wish the Japan arbitration was able to combine the best of both worlds. So going beyond the Americanization and due process paranoia typical of the common law experience, but also getting rid of some um, stiff uh, like conservative practices typical of the civil law world. That's that's the 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 way I see so that, that Japan can provide something new and alternative to other competitors. Yeah, nice. Yep. Not easy to achieve, but uh, and also uh, English language. And English language. Bit. They need to put an effort. Number two, number two. Yeah. Number two, you've got the last word before we wrap up. All right. Uh, well, uh, this is very, very optimistic. But uh, uh, Professor Fuan said um, Australia should well become something like, like Sweden. Uh, so I think Japan can do the same, emphasize its position between China and America. So oh. it's... No, 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 no. Australia is siding America and and England, I would say. But Japan is more neutral. It has its own culture and tradition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Unlike Australia, who is who is always looking up England, British people. Uh, so uh, emphasizing this neutrality, maybe there's a hope for Japan. But okay. let's let's see what happens. Well, on that on that hopeful note, please thank the speakers. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, apologies again on behalf of Professor Warren, um, but Ashley has a record of the attendees and can email them the, the written up remarks from her when uh, when they're available. So thank you again.